Hello, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to the webinar. My name is Anna Rosenbaum. I'm Public Affairs Manager for the National Association of Regional Councils. If you should have any technical questions during this webinar, please email my colleague Cameron directly. His information is on the welcome screen that you see in front of you. He will also be managing the question section that you see on the side of your screen. Please note that we will have a short five-minute video to play later in the presentation, and you'll need to use your computer computer speakers for it. We also have handouts on the side of the screen for you. So today, I'm pleased to be joined by several experts in the field of green infrastructure and resiliency. First, we will hear from Brett Schwartz, Program Manager for the National Association of Development Organizations, or NATO. He manages the NATO Research Foundation's Economic Resilience and Diversification Portfolio and promotes community and economic development policies at the state and federal levels. Brett is a graduate of the University of Baltimore School of Law, where he focused on land use issues and holds degrees from Georgetown University and Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland. Brett will provide an overview of NATO's resiliency activities and related initiatives. Next, we will hear from Andrew Hillman, the Northeast Regional Business Developer for Davie Resource Group and a senior urban forestry consultant. Prior to joining Davey, Andrew was city forester for the city of Ithaca, New York, and managed the urban forestry program for Oswego, New York. He has over 30 years of experience in urban forest management and is currently an instructor for the Society's Municipal Forestry Institute, a past president of the New York State Urban Forestry Council, and a member of the Finger Lakes Land Trust. In addition, he volunteers as a biodiversity nature preserve steward and serves on the town of Ulysses, New York Sustainability and Conservation Advisory Council. Andrew will provide an informative overview of the use of trees and green infrastructure and storm water management. Next, we will have Travis Miller. He's Regional Planning Manager for the Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana Regional Council of Governments, the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Greater Cincinnati Region. Travis manages various agency programs and leads regional environmental planning efforts. He is a landscape architect with a Master of Community Planning from the University of Cincinnati and a Bachelor of Science in Landscape Architecture from The Ohio State University. Travis also serves as an adjunct instructor for the University of Cincinnati School of Planning, teaching courses on transportation and energy planning. Travis will provide you with the background on the partnerships and funding that made treesandstormwater.org possible. And finally, we'll hear from Larry Wiseman. Larry has worked in the woods for nearly four decades, most recently in urban forestry. After serving as founding president and CEO of American Forest Foundation, he chaired the National Urban and Community Forestry Advisory Council and remains a senior advisor to the Sustainable Urban Forest Coalition. Larry will cover the document builder portion of the website. There will be time for questions and discussion at the end of the presentation. If you have a question during the presentation, please type a question to the question box on your control panel. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Brett. Great. Thanks so much, Anna. Am I coming through? Yes, you are. Great. Thanks. So, um, yeah, as you guys are pulling up my uh, screen, I just want to thank you, Anna and Cameron, for, for having me on the call today. Again, my name is uh, Brett Schwartz. I'm a program manager with the NATO Research Foundation. Uh, the Research Foundation is a nonprofit research and training arm of the National Association of Development Organizations, a membership association of regional planning and economic development organizations from across the country. Um, so I head up our uh, resilience and economic diversification portfolio, as well as provide training and support on planning and implementing the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy, or SED, uh, which I know many of you on the call produce as part of your work. So I'm really grateful to uh, my colleague, Dinar, for reaching out to me today uh, to be a part of this webinar and provide some framing remarks about resilience and how today's topic of trees, uh, stormwater, green infrastructure, you know, fit into this larger conversation about fostering resilient communities and regions. So I'll discuss our approach to resilience, especially regional resilience, uh, share some of our own resources, and give two quick examples of our members who are incorporating green infrastructure into their resilience planning. And then I'll turn it over to the rest of the panelists who will be able to dive really deep into these themes and showcase a really great new website and tool to uh, support your work. Uh, so with that, we'll, we'll flip over to the next slide. 
so the term resilience, you know, is certainly having a moment these days and seems to be everywhere we look. And, uh, you know, some have claimed that it's just a new way of thinking about sustainability. Um, but I would argue that it's much more than just a buzzword. It's a really workable framework to support building strong and prosperous communities in a region. So the concept of resilience has its roots in the sciences, particularly math and physics, uh, which define it as the ability of something to resume an original position or shape after it being bent or compressed. And then the 1970s, this concept was used to describe ecosystems responding to changes and pressures on the environment. And then it was incorporated into the disaster preparedness and recovery field, and then more recently to describe wider community and regional economic resilience. So a recent literature review found that there's over 20 definitions of community resilience to disasters. So in summary, it's, it's a complex term uh, that draws on a variety of fields, uh, including the hard sciences and economic development. Uh, next slide. So we at the uh, NATO Research Foundation have embraced the U.S. Economic Development Administration's broad and inclusive definition of resilience, as that being the ability of a region or community to anticipate, withstand, and bounce back from any type of shock or disruption. So this can include natural disasters, hazards, and other impacts from a change in climate, but also man-made economic shocks, uh, such as the closure of a region's large employer, uh, the decline of an important industry, and changes in the workforce and, and demographic shifts. So the power of this type of definition is that it broadens attention away from, from purely an emergency response, you know, how to deal with the immediate impact of a disruptive event, to really planning and organizing in advance and rebuilding afterwards with a coherent framework. So we at NATO recently created a short animated video on resilience uh, that I don't have time to show on today's webinar, um, but I hope that you can take a look at it afterwards. You can see the link uh, provided up there on the screen. So we hope that you can kind of take a look at this video and, and share it on, on social media, post on your website, or use at community meetings or events in your own region uh, to start a conversation in your community about resilience and what it means for your residents and local businesses. Uh, next slide. So up on the screen now, you should be seeing kind of a visual representation of the many reasons why we need to be more resilient, both to those natural shocks caused by a change in climate, uh, but also man-made economic impacts. And as all of us know, you know, none of this is simply theory or an academic exercise. You know, all of these issues have really become front page news, uh, particularly over the past year, you know, including the conveyor belt of hurricanes that we've experienced this fall uh, to the downturn and decline of the coal industry and other once dominant business sectors. Uh, next slide. So, you know, I mentioned earlier about that, you know, scientific definition of resilience being the ability of something to return to its original shape after being stressed. Um, however, when we're talking about creating resilient communities and regions, you know, we're not talking about getting back to the status quo after a shock, but, but really getting to something much better. And this means really taking advantage of, of a disaster or shock and building and developing in a way that is better than in the past. You know, for example, there's often a missed opportunity following disasters, you know, in the rush to rebuild quickly and, and get back to normal. And that's certainly a very natural response. Um, but by taking a closer look at, at your community zoning ordinances, uh, design guidelines, parking ordinances, and other regulations, you know, there's really a tremendous opportunity to, to get to a better position rather than just recreating a past that may not have been really optimal in the first place. So this approach has kind of been described as, as bouncing forward or, or bouncing back better. And so planning for resilience allows us to position our communities for long-term prosperity and success, even in the face of an uncertain economic and environmental landscape. And today we'll be hearing more about how green infrastructure and, and tree canopy strategies are a perfect fit for recalibrating your approach to planning, to economic development, and environmental stewardship in your communities and regions. And these are all efforts that should find their way into your SEDS plans and other regional planning and economic development plans following a really robust public engagement and discussion process. And we'll be hearing more about that today as well. Uh, next slide. So both NATO and NARC are associations of regional development organizations. You know, so we and our members really recognize the value of thinking regionally about planning and economic development. Um, but why think regionally about resilience? And really it's for many of those same reasons. And you can see up on the screen uh, just a few of those reasons for why forming regional partnerships and working at the regional level on resilience is really critical. And so, you know, we've got similar risks and opportunities across boundaries, uh, the interdependence of economies and infrastructure, uh, the value of knowing what's happening in a neighboring jurisdiction, and, and really the benefits of an all-hands-on-deck approach make working regionally on resilience a natural fit. And for those of you who serve and work in rural places, you know, where resources and support may be limited, you know, this regional approach is almost required uh, to achieve a long-lasting and sustainable outcome. Uh, so next slide. So I just want to point all of you to an online report uh, that we developed a few years back called Planning for Resilience, uh, which is available at planningforresilience.com. Uh, there's a lot of great info in there about 
state of resilience planning, uh, various elements of the federal framework that's in place, and also philanthropic organizations and resources that are supporting resilience work at the local, state, and regional, and national level. Um, and I know that many of you on the call um, work at regional planning commissions, councils of government, and other regional entities. Uh, so additionally, this document makes the case for what roles regional development organizations like yours play in supporting resilience initiatives. Uh, next slide. And so here are some of those broad themes um, that have emerged from our experience about the roles of, of regional organizations in supporting resilience efforts. You know, and these include uh, assisting with regional planning and analysis, uh, building and enhancing local capacity, coordinating with partners at different levels of government, convening stakeholders, and, and contributing to long-term regional perspectives. And for many of you, this is pretty typical of the work that you do in general. So working on resilience efforts really fits in nicely with all the work that all of you are doing around planning, workforce, economic development, transportation, and, and other efforts. And so that box on the right is actually pulled from our report and, and features 10 ways that regional organizations can improve resilience for the communities. So hope you can check out the report and kind of track your own organization's strengths and weaknesses uh, in the areas of providing capacity building uh, for your regions uh, in this area. Uh, next slide. So before I wrap up, just want to give kind of two quick examples of our members who are promoting resilience uh, through green infrastructure initiatives to really demonstrate how a regional entity can, can utilize its, its expert uh, expertise and, and networks. And, and of course, we'll be hearing shortly from Travis at OKL Council of Government in Cincinnati. He'll be talking about uh, the work that they do at the regional level. Uh, so first, I wanted to highlight the work of the Santee Lynch's Regional Council of Governments uh, located in Sumter, South Carolina. Uh, so back in 2015, uh, Santee Lynch has launched a regional green infrastructure planning process uh, for its four-county region, uh, which led to the development of a geospatial database and map. And so this inventory has been utilized by municipalities, uh, transportation agencies, uh, natural resource organizations, and others to really incorporate green infrastructure planning into long-range efforts. So this includes uh, land development regs, uh, zoning ordinances, economic development, transportation plans, as well as recreation and green space plans. And the information gathered from this process um, has been incorporated into many of the 10-year comprehensive plans for, for both cities and counties uh, in this region. And so what's really great about this is that the asset inventory is also available as an Esri story map, uh, which you can access using the link up on the screen after the webinar. And this story map has many different data layers, uh, including intact habitat cores, 40-year uh, urban growth projection, and some visualizations uh, between the overlap of, of current intact cores and some areas for, for potential future development. So this, I think, is a really great example of a regional development organization using its data, its mapping capabilities, and, and other information skills uh, to be able to provide its member municipalities with resources for, for better planning and really about making more informed decisions about the future uh, of their region. And the next slide. So the last example I just want to cover briefly is the Houston Galveston area council's uh, designing for impact project. And so it's anticipating the Houston area um, that that region will grow by 3.5 million people in the next 25 years, um, which will lead to an extreme increase in the amount of impervious surface area and stormwater infrastructure in the region unless other strategies are pursued and adopted. And so the Area Council spearheaded efforts to promote low impact development and green infrastructure in the region uh, through developing a guide for local governments, uh, hosting workshops in the region, and creating an interactive web page and web tools of projects in the area. So all these efforts are meant to really educate and inspire local governments, uh, developers, architects, designers, and, and local residents to really embrace these strategies. Um, and the guide uh, includes case studies and and hypothetical cost comparisons and environmental impacts of low impact design versus conventional building. So all these materials are available on the webpage uh, posted on the screen. Uh, they're certainly geared towards um, the Houston region. Um, could certainly help you out as well with some of the thoughts and examples in, in your own region. And again, you know, here's another example of, of a regional organization using its expertise and access to, uh, to data, to information, and key stakeholders to provide useful resource to, to the region. Unfortunately, I, have, I haven't been in touch with staff on the Area Council uh, since the hurricane they experienced last month, um, but, but certainly would be interested to learn more about how these projects fared during the storm, uh, and I could certainly see that being a, a future uh, webinar topic for us to cover. Uh, next slide. So as I wrap up, just want to point you to some resources uh, that we have available on resilience planning, uh, which are all aimed at primarily regional planning commissions and other economic development districts. Much of this work has emerged uh, through our partnership with the U.S. Economic Development Administration over the past few years, um, and we've housed all this information on our SEDS resource archive 
uh, which is really a one-stop shop for, for all those working on on the comprehensive economic development strategy. Um, so we've got case studies, we've got webinars, publications, and more uh, on resilience, uh, economic diversification, and disaster recovery here. Everything's free to download. Um, so whether you've been working on this for many years or you're kind of new to this subject, hopefully there's something there uh, that speaks to you and, and your needs. So I hope you can check that out uh, as you continue your work. And the last slide, which I think is just it's just me. So uh, with that, you know, I'll bow out and, uh, and pass the baton on to our expert speakers to, to really discuss exactly how you can incorporate uh, green infrastructure and, and trees uh, into your larger resilience and stormwater planning. You know, these, these strategies are real incredible opportunities to, to strengthen your region's economy and, and improve quality of life for residents, um, all while protecting the environment and beautifying your towns and neighborhoods. So I think it's, it's a win across the board. So it's a real honor to be part of this uh, discussion today, and I'm excited to hear from the rest of the panelists. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back to Anna to move things along. Uh, now, we're, now we're gonna hear from Andrew. Take it away, Andrew. Okay, just waiting for the uh, screen. So welcome everybody, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Uh, good morning for those of you on the West Coast. And what I'm going to talk about briefly is the role of trees in stormwater management. And uh, we'll talk about some of the functions that the trees uh, perform, especially when they're part of a uh, integral to a green infrastructure uh, comp you know, component. and. Um, and then we'll also look at a, a briefly look at a case study. Uh, it's a, uh, a, a green infrastructure installation where trees are uh, a vital and uh, maybe perhaps the most important component. And uh, we'll take a look at that. And, and incidentally, it was uh, this was originally construction in, in 2005, about the time Hurricane Katrina happened. So we'll, we'll take a look at that at the end of the. Uh, talk about how trees um, help in green infrastructure and in stormwater management. So a lot of these you know, are simple concepts. We think about them all the time. But uh, it will take a little more, uh, some of the stuff we take for granted and, and uh, think that it's really obvious. But let's we'll just think about it a little bit more this afternoon. So transpiration is the process by which moisture is carried through plants from roots to small pores on the underside of leaves, where it changes the vapor and it's released to the atmosphere. Essentially, uh, it's evaporation of water from plant leaves. The pores or openings on the leaves are called stomata. And it's estimated that about 98% of a plant's energy is used in the work of transpiration. In the summer, a large maple tree can transpire 50 to 60 gallons of water per hour into the atmosphere. And this all works because of the capillary action and bonding of water. And, and think about a redwood tree pulling all that column of water up from the ground up hundreds of feet simply through capillary action, and which is initiated by evaporation up in the, up in the leaves. Another way that trees help in, in stormwater management is through interception. And interception is important to stormwater management because it reduces the peak flow. A good example of the way this works is you know how when a rain event begins, you can shelter under a tree to stay dry, but then long after the rain stops, it's still dripping under the canopy of that previously that tree that previously kept you dry. And when we uh, when we build stormwater systems and pipes and and conveyances, they have to be built to accommodate the peak flow. So if we can reduce the peak flow, theoretically we can um, save money on construction of stormwater structures. Another thing that to consider when we're thinking about trees and green infrastructure and stormwater management and in general uh, 
mid urban trees is uh, reduced through fall. And reduced through fall, fall can not only uh, help prevent erosion, but by diminishing the velocity of the rain, it can also affect the first flush by reducing the amount of litter. It can be washed into storm systems and water bodies and uh, just uh, diminishing the energy that that rain and that storm water has to, to erode and to flush things into places we don't want them. Increased infiltration is, is pretty interesting uh, to me because I think about roots a lot. Uh, I've planted many, many bare root trees and I want to buy roots. So I want to see them. So uh, when we talk about increased infiltration, one thing that tree roots uh, they do is they continually grow and then they die. And so small roots, feeder roots are growing all the time and drying. And this affects the soil by adding organic material and that will increase water infiltration. It, it uh, basically improves the tilth and the texture. So by improving the, the soil, tilth and texture, it benefits the tree, makes the tree grow better, um, providing all the other services that the tree is doing, improving that. And it makes the site better for stormwater mitigation. So remember, it's interesting when we think about it, uh, most of the carbon, the organic material, the, the actual roots, um, all of that came out of the atmosphere. The last uh, function that I want to talk about before we get into a little case study for a few minutes is phytoremediation. And, and this is uh, simply, it's the process of using trees and other plants as biological filters. So it's a key component we talk about ecosystem services and green infrastructure. Some of the best trees for phytoremediation are characterized by high water usage, fast growth, and deep root systems. And then so contaminants, uh, whether they're heavy metals or organic compounds, are either transformed or they're locked up in the tissue. Some examples of good trees for phytoremediation, at least in areas with significant rainfall, are hybrid willows and poplars. Now, I'd like to talk about an example of a of stormwater green infrastructure project where trees are, are like I said, maybe the most important component. So this, um, this parking lot you see, this is a future parking lot uh, that asphalt had just been laid. And this, this section up here is porous asphalt. This is traditional asphalt down here. And what you see here is where the CU structural soil is daylighted between the parking lot that will be built and this waterfront trail here in Ithaca, New York, which is adjacent to a flood control channel. So we thought it was a real appropriate site to, to uh, build this thing. And underneath this whole area, the entire parking lot, is a 30-inch profile of CU structural soil, which is uh, basically a number two stone with a, a high clay content loam tacked to it with a small amount of hydrogel. And what I did here was open up the, a big hole and, and put in three 10-inch lifts of this material and then simply put the asphalt right on top of that after compaction of each lift. And the structural soil will provide uh, the engineering uh, support that we need for the, for the hardscape. And yet it'll still allow tree roots to grow through it. And so it'll support the, the surface, but also support trees, tree life. So this, like I said, this was back in 2005 when we built this. When I had the hole open before we put in any of the uh, material, the remnants of Hurricane Katrina came through. Uh, by then, uh, upstate New York in the Finger Lakes here, it was just a tropical depression, but it, it was quite a rain event. And my hole quickly filled up with a lot of rainwater and then uh, 
it went down into the uh, native soil that was underneath, which uh, I called my perk test. So what I did was uh, cut slots into the parking lot, exposing the structural soil underneath it, and and then planted bare root hybrid elms directly into the soil. In this case, they were almost accolade. Uh, for tree geeks, it's a uh, almost Wilsoniana by almost Japonica. And it's a super fast growing disease resistant elm, which is one of the reasons we, we chose it for this. Because we wanted these trees to, to quickly do the work that we expected them to do as far as stormwater mitigation goes. So this was in the fall of 2005 when you see these trees being planted. Uh, by the way, you notice by, by making the tree planting sites like this, I didn't have to give up much room for parking spots. So we, which is always a concern, are there room for trees or we need more parking slots? So the trees um, lose out sometimes. This was in the spring of 2006. So the trees that we planted bare root in the fall uh, have all leafed out. And uh, you can see the porous asphalt is down in this area, the traditional asphalt in the foreground here. This daylighted strip of structural soil here uh, acts to prevent any runoff from going over the, the parking lot, across the trail, and into the, into the flood control channel. So there are no catch basins, no outfalls, no pipes or anything in this, in this system. And one thing that's very prominent and probably noticed is uh, these tubular steel tree guards, which uh, we designed in public works and manufactured them and installed them ourselves, uh, because the trees are such an important part of this system that uh, we had to make sure that they didn't get run over, didn't get banged into, didn't get plowed, um, you know, bikes or anything locked to them. So we wanted to keep the trees alive because you don't want to start all over again. And uh, once you have the time invested in them. So then, uh, this is a few years ago, but you can easily see that every parking spot is shaded. The canopy is almost closed at this point. And, and these trees have all survived and thrived. And they're doing the work we want. They're pumping that water out into the atmosphere when they're transpiring as pure H2O. They're reducing the, uh, the peak, which allows all the water to infiltrate. And this parking lot is designed to take a 100-year rain event, uh, which I think is coming about every five or 10 years now. So uh, it's been pretty successful. It seems to be functioning the way we want. And you can see when we pull back and look at it, here's the parking lot here. And this is what I meant by we can build parking forests rather than parking deserts. And parking in deserts when it rains, the water, if when it does rain, that water can run off and cause flash floods and everything. And in a forest, Typically, that rain is absorbed and held back and slowly released. And so this, this uh, parking lot is functioning that way. That's about what I had to talk about as far as trees and stormwater and how they fit into uh, green infrastructure and stormwater management. Just a, a few of the ways and, and one uh, example that I'm really, uh, really proud of. It's, it's just worked out way we wanted to over the past 12 years and and um, there's also we talk about phytoremediation we believe that there may be some phytoremediation going on in the structural soil um, but through microbial action as well as in the trees and there are there are test wells that we placed four test wells wells in this uh, parking lot so that water samples can be taken in the future by uh, researchers um, and also, yeah, that's I guess that's about it. The uh, we're hoping that um, that there is that phytoremediation going on, and that, uh, that this this parking lot will continue to function. And hopefully, more parking lots can be built like this in the future. So, thank you very much. I appreciate the the time that 
that I've had here to talk about trees and stormwater. I'll turn it back over. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience with us, Andrew. Now we'll hear from Travis. Go ahead, Great. Travis. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. Uh, let's wait for my screen to come up. Okay, thanks again, Anna. Uh, really pleased to be here today and share with the audience a brand new tool uh, that's available for them to focus, that focuses uh, on trees as a component of stormwater management systems. Uh, again, I'm a regional planning manager with OKI. Uh, just by way of introduction, uh, OKI is the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the greater Cincinnati tri-state region. Uh, our region consists of just under 200 local jurisdictions ranging from urban to suburban to rural communities. Uh, and we work with um, each of them to provide resources and tools uh, that assist with planning uh, activities across the region. As our agency continually works in partnership with our jurisdictions to address regional planning issues, stormwater management seems to be more and more a central focus. Like most, if not all other regions across the country, uh, we are faced with the need to reinvest in old infrastructure systems. And as we plan for this investment, green infrastructure solutions are at the forefront of consideration, but these solutions must be practical and they must be reliable as we invest in systems that need to last for generations. Our region maintains a strategic regional policy plan that we've branded, How Do We Grow From Here? This plan helps us have a comprehensive, uh, or as Brett described earlier, the all hands on deck approach to infrastructure system planning. Our region's trees and tree canopy is recognized by this plan as an asset with many benefits, including stormwater benefits. To develop this plan, um, the development of this plan, as we developed the plan, uh, we came to the realization that we needed a tool to assist local decision makers uh, to better understand things like peak flow reduction and other benefits that, that Andrew described uh, as we consider trees and integrating trees into stormwater management systems. So with support from the Forest Service OKI team with the national partners listed here to develop a guide, again, designed for local decision makers. Davy Resource Group provided their expertise to ensure the guide included practical information applicable to any type and size community. Davy provided case study examples um, like the ones that you, that you just saw uh, from Andrew uh, and, and, and others that you'll be able to explore in the guide uh, and, and apply uh, to your own communities. Larry Wiseman, Centerline Strategy, who you hear from in a moment, has worked to ensure that all the information contained in this guide is easily accessible to you and in a way that quickly gets you the resources that are most helpful to your situation. National Association of Region Councils, NARC, Anna and her team, um, uh, helped to engage their members uh, in regions across the country as we developed the guide to ensure that uh, it was applicable nationally. NARC has also assisted with the website design uh, and will maintain the guide, uh, ensuring access to anyone interested in the resource in the future. In addition, this guide was developed with input and guidance from experts from across the country. We used a national advisory committee in tandem with our regional project advisory committee. The regional committee focused on practical solutions for local governments, while the national committee served to ensure the tool, again, would be nationally applicable. The resources of the guide were vetted through focus group consultations with community engineers, with urban foresters, and with stormwater managers. To engage so many people in so many places, we employed technology using webcasts and online surveys, in addition to in-person workshops, to get input throughout the development of the resource. So as you'll see, uh, this tool and its resources do provide evidence that integrating trees into stormwater management works, and there's a high return on these investments. It includes case studies that are relevant to every community. Experts through our consultations told us that case studies are really only valuable if they're similar to their own situation. So this tool features case studies in all climatic regions of the country and in all community types. In a moment, we're going to delve into what's maybe the most unique uh, part of the guide, the ability to customize all the information most relevant to you and organize it in a report specific to your community. But before we jump into that, uh, I want to share with you a video 
that highlights the features of the guide. So I'm going to turn this back over to Anna, and we're going to play a video that uh, it's about five minutes. Uh, but it okay, now we're going to hear from Larry Wiseman. Thank you so much, Larry. Thank you, Anna. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Let me find where I am. Here we are. If there was ever a time uh, when the term resilience uh, held greater meaning, I, I personally can't think of it. Um, Brett talked about a conveyor belt of storms. I, I personally think it's more like a sledgehammer of storms. And one of the uh, only positive effects of these multiplying disasters is that it can refocus the importance of trees in stormwater management and in community resilience. That's the philosophy behind the document builder. Uh, I want to point out this is a work in progress. Um, any hope you guys dig in and uh, pass on any comments or uh, complaints, compliments, anything that you think will make it a better document, we'd like to see. So both Travis and Brett and Andrew intimated why it would be important to uh, create a document. Um, there are really just two reasons. One, you want to learn more about stormwater management and trees and how they fit into not just green infrastructure, but into overall community resilience. We talked about some, uh, some of the benefits that, that accrue there too. Um, from public health to energy conservation, frankly, to economic development. Um, as we face today's challenges of community development or community rebuilding uh, and dealing with the impacts of climate change, it reinforces the notion that we have to be very careful and very, very, uh, I would say, aggressive in promoting the use of trees in stormwater management. What's the big impediment? Uh, we did a lot of surveys, as Travis said, and the biggest impediment uh, really is the difficulty in aligning municipal departments behind uh, a program of integrating trees into their uh, gray infrastructure initiatives. Uh, we have an opportunity now. There's going to be a lot of uh, reconstruction money pouring into various communities. And we have an opportunity now to educate the people who are going to be directing those funds to take a look at trees and to understand the full benefits to their uh, stakeholders, their residents, uh, what trees can do for their neighborhood. So the second audience really for the document builder is the folks with whom you work within your municipal government. And it can be very valuable. It's a learning tool for you and a teaching tool, but it's also a way to stimulate policymakers to act. One of the ways that you can communicate the benefits of green infrastructure and trees as part of green infrastructure uh, is to help your colleagues focus on the multiple benefits. Um, green infrastructure is pretty much part of the vocabulary for engineers, planners, uh, even policymakers and elected officials. Um, what's less apparent is what trees add to that equation. And I'm not going to go through this infographic, but you can see that it ranges from carbon uptake, we heard a little bit about that, energy conservation, stormwater management, health and well being, so forth. So, how uh, I'm hearing buzzing, is that, am I still audible here? Hello? Hello? I guess yes, I'm you are. Okay. Um, 
So what's the Document Builder? It's really a detailed questionnaire. There are about 40 different queries. They're all, almost all of them are multiple choice. Uh, this is sort of a basic um, set of questions that uh, deals with the kinds of plans and programs that are in place in your organization. Uh, you have the option of answering yes, no, and not sure on this series. Uh, users report that it takes about 20 minutes to 25 minutes to complete the questionnaire. Uh, once you answer the question, uh, depending on your answer, the document builder produces a different uh, segment of text, uh, text module, let's call it. Uh, if you say yes, there's a paragraph that explains why that particular uh, uh, item is important to your community. Uh, and it also, you'll also have in the finished document the opportunity to import data from iTree or insert data of your own. Uh, no uh, delivers a text module that demonstrates the benefits that would accrue to your community if uh, that policy or that practice were put into place. Not sure. Um, is similar to know, but with some additional guidance uh, in terms of where you can find information about the matter that's under discussion. So here are some answers to um, um, the questions that were posed earlier. Uh, why is it important to know your canopy cover? If you say yes, you get the first paragraph. But if you say no, we're not sure. Um, the second paragraph is added to it. And that is the paragraph that makes the case to others that we must have uh, a better sense of our tree canopy and the services it provides. Likewise with street tree inventory. Many communities will have these, but very often they're out of date. Um, and those that don't have one that's up to date, they remain stuck in reactive mode, <laughs> very expensive. Uh, fixing problems as they reported, and in the unenviable uh, position of spending more to accomplish less. Uh, here's a set of questions about um, comprehensive planning. Um, most of you folks, I would suspect, understand the importance of it. But what we address here is how urban forestry should become an integral aspect of your comprehensive plan, not just for aesthetics, but for all of the benefits that it can provide, including community resilience. Community resilience, not just in stormwater management, but also in terms of neighborhood cohesion, public health, better educational contexts, uh, crime, community uh, cohesion, and so forth. So when you enter it, um, the video talked about uh, establishing an identity within the um, document builder. It will allow you to create a new document or complete a document that's already in progress. One of the advantages of that feature, uh, saving various documents, is that by answering parts of the questionnaire and creating a document for those parts is that you can target it to specific audiences. Uh, if it's for planners, you can create one sort of document. If it's for stormwater engineers, you can create uh, another kind of document that refers um, more directly perhaps to some of the stormwater cost benefit calculators uh, that are embedded in the site. Um, once you have created a document, you can download it uh, as either a P PDF or as a Word document and adjust it, insert uh, different material, add graphics if you have imported some in general to make it your own. Uh, once you've done all that, it's exportable in any format you choose. I'm going to leave these up for a couple secs just to let you see some of the topics that are covered in the document builder. We're trying our best to make this as comprehensive as possible without, be over, without being overwhelming. 
If you see anything miss, missing, let us know. You'll notice we have some site-specific questions. Private property is very important because private land policies will have the most significant impact on your tree canopy and the subsequent benefits that it delivers to your community. And that just about does it. Take it away. Thank you so much, Larry. Um, now we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please uh, select the raise your hand button on your control panel or type a question into the questions box. All right, so we do have one question. Um, could one of you guys address, address the issue of um, the love of trees in rural communities and um, and the issue about road foremen cutting trees along the right of way versus the all too common FEMA declaration for a disaster involving windstorms, ice storms, et cetera? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I've never been muzzled like that before. Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're able to witness firsthand uh, right now in real time how FEMA is tr uh, treating urban, urban forestry. For those of you familiar with the wholesale slaughter that took place of trees that took place after Katrina, uh, pleased to say that the situation has changed uh, considerably. FEMA now requires, uh, or at least endorses, the use of um, trained arborists to assess whether a tree constitutes a risk to life or property before they will compensate a contractor to re either repair the tree or to remove it. In the past, uh, FEMA debris contractors were paid by the truckload. And so you had this sort of phenomenon where there was a perverse incentive for the guy who drove up to your house in a pickup truck and a chainsaw said, oh, that tree is dangerous. That's going to hit your house like it hit your neighbors. They have an incentive to cut that down because it pads their pocket. Meanwhile, the homeowner, because they're fearful, says yes. Uh, and what they lose out on are the benefits, which are considerable that that tree provides to their property. Um, I suspect we're gonna see a lot less of that kind of uh, uh, inappropriate uh, behavior in the future. The other thing I'd point out is that the Forest Service has a whole uh, cadre of what they call urban forest strike teams, which are volunteer urban foresters and arborists who have been specially trained to assess tree risk. And they are already on site at the um, in the various communities that have been affected by Irma, Jose, Maria, etc. Thank you, Larry. Um, we have another question. Um, the Ithaca uh, parking lot project used structural soils to allow for root growth under the pavement. Uh, was consideration given to other load-bearing technologies like uh, silva cells? Sure. Um, in that project, we were actually co uh, cooperating with uh, Dr. Nina Basic and the Urban Horticulture Institute at Cornell, and so uh, it was part of a of a larger project that involved Virginia Tech and UC Davis and Cornell University. So 
our role uh, as in public works was simply to uh, follow directions and uh, come up with ideas if we could and, and assist in the construction of the parking lot. Um, and so, yeah, things like uh, other silver cells, other methods like that to um, support hardscape weren't part of this particular project or the decisions going into it. But, you know, there are many ways to get uh, large trees to grow in urban environment and uh, store, store stormwater and uh, structural soil is just one of them. But it also, what, one of the most coolest things about it is it supports tree growth and, uh, and it's inexpensive compared to many other methods. Yeah, let me interject. Um, one of the critical elements, and I, I would argue that one of the most critical elements uh, in tree survivability is soil volume and type. And un unless you pay attention to that, you can plant a lot of trees, hang around eight to 10 years and watch them die, which is a waste of money, obviously. Uh, different communities have different protocols for uh, tree planting. Uh, many of them recommend uh, soil volumes. A common number is 500 cubic feet, but it does depend on species. Uh, that number can go higher for some species, depending on the site. Um, your state forester or your community arborist will be able to guide you toward the right species and help you identify how to uh, create a soil environment that's conducive to growth. Thanks, Larry. Um, and, and uh, if I could, Andrew, if, uh, sorry, if, did you have? Did you want to add, Andrew? Yeah, if I could just follow up. Uh, so you, the, the trees have thrived in that particular installation, as you can see from the photo. So over 12 years, um, you know, the the canopy's closed, and they're they're functioning the way that we wanted to in that uh, particular stormwater mitigation green infrastructure project. Uh, what would you estimate the soil volumes in those trenches to be? <clears throat> well, there are no trenches. The entire parking lot's underlain with um, a 30 inch profile of structural soil. So okay. you know, essentially they've got uh, basically unlimited rooting volume. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, with ground penetrating radar, uh, Dr. Bassick has looked at where the roots are growing and uh, like, like you might suspect, they're doing a little bit better under the porous asphalt than mm -hmm. under the asphalt. All right, thank you both. Uh, we have time for, or we're running a little over, but we have one more question, um, so we'll just get to that. Uh, can any of you talk about inventory of planning sites in relation to stormwater management? Sure, I can take that one. <clears throat> um, when I was city forester, the, the, the most important reason for having an inventory for me was number one, where's my risk? Because that goes to public safety. But then number two, where are my vacant planning sites? Because I want to fill them all and so we can get the maximum uh, benefits like stormwater management, the reduction of heat island and energy savings, uh, you know, all the, all the ecosystem services we get from trees. They're the uh, real shovel-ready green infrastructure. Yeah, the the, the more difficult uh, task, of course, uh, deals with the trees that are on private property. And for the most part, that for most communities, that constitutes as much as 80% of the total tree canopy. Uh, on the site, uh, you'll find a number of ordinances that different communities have used to uh, influence the behavior of property owners and to guide how they treat their trees. Some, some incentive programs, some regulatory programs, low impact development guidelines or ordinances that are in place uh, that are mandatory, a whole variety of strategies for dealing with private lands. But that, that uh, in many ways uh, is one of the most difficult challenges uh, because it's uh, so intensely political. Well, uh, thank you, Brett, Andrew, Travis, and Larry for, for talking with us today.
As a reminder for everyone, uh, everyone on this webinar, you will receive an email within the next 24 hours. It'll include a link to the video of the presentation and other resources. Um, thank you again for your attendance, and we look forward to your participation on other webinars. Have a great day. Bye-bye.